Today is April 10, 2012. We're with Ivern Ulf Hume in Williamsburg, Virginia. And I'd like to start off by having you tell me a little bit about your beginnings. Where were you born, the year? Uh, all that very interesting stuff. All that interesting stuff. The problem is when you get to your 80s that you don't remember it very well and your memory is sometimes shot, so I may come apart in the middle of this. No problem. <laughs> but uh, I was born uh, in London uh, on the 30th of September 1927. That was before the crash. Um, and those were the good days. Uh, my family, my father, uh, was the European representative for the Central Hanover Bank and Trust Company in New York. It was a very good job. Uh, and he was very good at it because he was a very social person. Uh, he didn't have to do much except be social. Um, the snag with that, however, was the crash eventually came and he lost the job. By that time, I think I was three. Um, my life in those days was really the uh, the, the uh, rich and wealthy, uh, middle class, whatever, uh, living high on the hog, because the hog was large. And uh, my mother, however, um, found that uh, the funds were inadequate. Uh, and so uh, she had a, uh, a friend who was an elderly man, uh, who uh, owned a hardware store. It was like Harrods in the north. And he was very rich. Um, and so he gave these young people money whenever they needed it. Well, he liked my mother better than he liked my father. That's quite clear. Um, but it resulted eventually in a divorce. Um, and uh, we still lived in the best part of London, in Knightsbridge. Uh, we had a nice house, we, we had a, a butler, we had maids, so we had people to look after me. Uh, this was important because nobody wanted to see me. Uh, little boys should be seen and not heard, but not frequently. Uh, and so uh, my early life was really spent in the nursery. Uh, I'm being pushed around Hyde Park in a uh, and a, what you call a stroller, I call a perambulator. Um, and uh, in those days, uh, it was common uh, to throw enormous parties, which my mother did. She was a good pianist until she fell uh, in uh, Switzerland, broke her arm, and then she afterwards had trouble with it. But uh, the, these were big, great days. But she was not a very nice person. And on one of these occasions, uh, the butler and the cook uh, were at the door with their suitcases uh, when the first guests arrived. This was a crisis of monumental proportions. But from there, we went on downhill. My father having lost the job, my mother relying on Uncle Fred. Uh, which she did throughout my early childhood and in fact two days before the Second World War broke out uh, the worst possible news came Uncle Fred was dead um, and when Uncle Fred was dead all the money went out too. The family was not amused by this relationship. Uh, my mother however um, managed not only to have Uncle Fred but she was always looking to get remarried, uh, which uh, she had several shots at. Um, the man who owned E.B. Bath Powder. I remember this because uh, I uh, had these little floating things in the bathtub uh, which dissolved, and that, that was his stuff. Uh, but there were people like that, and, and they, some of them gave me things. Uh, that particular guy uh, gave me a watch. It didn't work. But it was one of those uh, futuristic watches with a little s slot in the thing. In it. And so I got hooked uh, at that very early age uh, on gadgets. And I, and I still love gadgets. 
Um, anyway, uh, I was shipped off to boarding school at the age of six. Uh, you see, uh, as my mother grew older, so did I. Uh, and it was hard to hide me, um, although up until the uh, beginning of the war with Uncle Fred to help us out, we still had servants. One of the extraordinary things was that I, you know, I looked at photographs of which I have scads. These are fragments of my life, you know. And the awful thing is that when I die, nobody will have the slightest knowledge of what they're all about. They are my history, for what it's worth. Uh, here I am at the age of two. <laughs> ah, it isn't that funny because I had rickets. I was born with rickets. Um, and they claimed it was caused by the fact that my mother was a tennis player and she played tennis right up to the days I was born, but I don't think that's true. But anyway, I, I spent my early t life wrapped in plaster. Um, and, uh, well, there, there it was. So off I went to school. And uh, I continued going to various schools uh, until the, the war came along. Uh, and then uh, I had been at uh, Framlingham College where I was a junior. And it was a very good school. Um, I was not a very good pupil. Um, in fact, uh, the, uh, I remember only one master, whose name was the Reverend Rees, um, and he beat me soundly with his cane on several occasions. He also made me learn the Beatitudes, which I didn't think were very interesting. Um, so my memories of, of, of school life uh, well, there were things of dropping water bombs onto master's heads and things like that, uh, which was fun. Um, we also had a hall. You may not think this is relevant to anything, but it is. Um, we had, well, the school hall had weapons uh, from various wars. <coughs> Excuse me, the Boer War, uh, Zulu War, and so on, and this all around the walls. And after I had been there a year, uh, we came back uh, for the next term and found that they had all gone. Um, they had been hidden away underneath the chapel, locked. Well, I don't know whether it was me or somebody like me who found that there was a window um, underneath the chapel and you could get into this area where all these weapons were stored. Um, there were gangs, even in respectable schools there were gangs. And so my gang came uh, in trouble with another gang and uh, <coughs> I had a cut right here where I was hit with a sabre while trying to get out of the window. Certain things stay with you all your life. I have this one too. This was because when we were very rich and we went to Eastbourne and there uh, I had to sit on the beach. Now the beach at Eastbourne is pebbles. I mean lots and lots of pebbles. Very uncomfortable, providing you have enough cushions and people to bring out the food and things like that. Um, anyway, my nurse told me to make milk with, um, a, you take a bucket, fill it with sea water, you take a piece of chalk and you hit it with a flint. And then it dissolves it and then makes milk. Well, I hit my small finger with, uh, with the flint, uh, which opened up uh, rather like a, a strawberry. Uh, and uh, that scar I still have. But it's one of the few memories I have of those days. It takes a, a big things to do it. I mean, one of my nurses um, who we didn't like very much, at least I didn't. Um, she uh, shut my fingers in the door um, and I have vivid recollection of that door and this closing on the door. Uh, it was something I had done. On another occasion, 
I had a teddy bear which was made of wood. And she threw the teddy bear into the fire in the nursery. And I had to sit there and watch it burn. I remember that one too. So there aren't very many <laughs> memorable moments from all of this. Did you travel much as a child? No. No, no, well, uh, no, we really, we went up to, down to Eastbourne every summer where we had a house. Um, and uh, that was virtually, virtually it. In fact, um, before the war started, uh, my mother would go, would go off to, to, to France and to New York and so on. And I'd be left with Mrs. Bolton, who was our housekeeper. Um, and this became pretty dreary. Uh, and I often wanted to escape. And so there were people who lived below who had a, uh, a trailer, a caravan thing, and they invited me to go with them to, on their vacation to Devonshire. Uh, this was for me Valhalla, you know. Uh, and I, thought I, I felt sure I was going to be dead before it happened. I always thought that. Um, but it didn't ha did happen, and I went with the Morrisons down there where it rained the whole time. Um, but I found uh, a ruined mansion um, I I called Eggsford House. It had all the mystery of, the, of medieval towers and all that sort of, absolutely wonderful. And, and I was, became enthralled with antiquities. And standing at this house, which, as I say, was ruined, um, I, I could see myself as a lord of its manor and so on. Yeah. Anyway, this is one of the things that started me off in the direction of archaeology. Um, not very seriously, but it, it, that was the way it was leading. Um, so that, anyway, the war comes, and uh, we, my mother and I, are chased around England by German bombs. Um, I was in Maidstone. I'd been evacuated uh, to uh, live with a naval couple um, at Maidstone, uh, which was where much of the Battle of Britain was fought. Um, and one of my joys was to see the planes come down, get on my bicycle, and chased down there and salvaged pieces before anybody else got there. Uh, this was the beginning of collecting. Uh, I had a swastika off, off the tail of a mess, among other things, and a lot of live ammunition too, uh, which I shouldn't have had. Uh, there was a uh, one night we had a what is called a bread basket, which the well, bread baskets were things like that long, uh, and they contained hundreds of uh, uh, incendiary bombs. And this thing burst in the garden. It didn't, they didn't go off, thank God. But anyway, that was my first encounter with incendiary bombs, and I'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> but anyway, um, we were chased around. Uh, when the Battle of Britain was over, um, I was supposed to go back and join my mother, who was by that time in Cambridge, where she had uh, a new a potential father for me. Um, and uh, as far as I know it, she married him, regardless of the fact that he already had a wife. And uh, so anyway, uh, I went back to London. And one of the interesting things about that was when you were going in a train in those days, they had uh, tape that were part of the windows and so on. Uh, I went through the beginning of the London bombing and there were ruined houses on either side of the train. And I could see uh, bathtubs hanging from walls and you know, collapsed houses and, and uh, air raid people scrambling all over them. And it had no effect on me at all. It was just like um, a play, although I hadn't been to plays at that point. But it was. And I've never understood quite why it is that one can look at something like that 
and be right in it and not understand that it was a threat. It was all fun, which is not what wars are supposed to be about, but that's the way it was to me at that point. Um, maybe we could break there. Sure. <laughs> when you're rolling, let me know. I am. Okay. Um, amongst these pictures, they're all pictures of my mother and our dog and my aunt. I hated my aunt. Um, and my Uncle Harold. This is a picture of Uncle Harold and his horse. Now, Uncle Harold was the black sheep of the family. Um, and in the early 30s, uh, he went off to Mexico, um, where he allegedly, um, well, bought the horse, uh, and uh, prospered. I've forgotten, I'm not quite sure what he did that prospered, but anyway, he then went uh, and joined Henry Ford's company as, I was told, his chief engineer. Uh, I looked into this years later and Henry Ford could find <laughs> nothing about him. But he came back to uh, England immediately after the war and gave me good advice. He said, young man, go to Mexico. That is where the future lies. So I, I, I believed him because he was a romantic kind of guy, although he was fat and drunk at that time. Um, and uh, so anyway, I, I bought a, a book on Teach Yourself uh, Spanish. And that was as far as that went. For 18 months after the war started, I didn't go to school at all. Um, it was a, a difficult time. Um, the children in 1939, oh, an interesting thing about people and so forth. Um, we lived uh, in a, an apartment block and uh, we had a porter who was always very obsequious. And uh, my mother was away, and on the uh, 3rd of September, when the war began, um, we heard the air raid siren go. We'd been expecting this for a long time because it, the barrage balloons up in the parks and people were digging trenches, putting up sandbags, and all that. Um, but when the war started, the, it was only a few minutes later that the sirens went. Uh, it, it turned out that it wasn't Germans, it was a French person going home, I think. But anyway, um, this immediately called for us to get our gas masks, which it went around little cardboard boxes, um, and go down to the basement for safety. Well, we didn't plan to do that, but the porter, who had been so obsequious, had now joined the defence thing, and he ordered us everybody down into the basement and he sounded exactly like one of Hitler's guys. Um, total change. But what's interesting about this really, I think, is that we didn't really understand the people at the time. There the, was the working class and there was us. And we saw them uh, as the porter, as the maid, as the housekeeper and so on. And we really didn't think about their lives. At least my, I, I wasn't old enough really to care, but my mother didn't. Uh, and she had uh, ideas that had to be maintained. For example, uh, if I put a stamp on an envelope, it had to be one quarter of an inch from the corners of the envelope. Anything else crooked like that was, was, was just taboo. Uh, also, I wasn't allowed to say golf. There's no L in golf. We say golf. You know, things like stupid things like that were the backbone <laughs> of my home education. Um, we were going to, uh, before everything went bust, uh, I was going to go to a school uh, at Cheam where the, uh, the princes went to uh, the junior, junior school. And while I was waiting, uh, while my mother talked to the headmaster about how, what a nice boy I was, um, I was allowed to uh, play with a silent movie projector. Um, 
And uh, with this, I saw my first movie, um, which was Mickey Mouse. But I was taken with this whole idea of the movie business. And that's remained with me always. But it started uh, at there at Cheam. But I didn't go to Cheam and we didn't have the money for it, as it turned out. Um, later, uh, oh, well, let me go back for a second to, into the war. This is, this is, is we going too long? This? No, you're fine. Uh, as long as you please. I'm fascinated, so please. But anyway, um, after the, the Blitz was virtually over, um, my mother, uh, we then were living with my grandmother, uh, decided that uh, we should leave London and go to somewhere safe. So, um, oh, before that, she had been trying to ship me off to Canada, um, but nobody would, uh, I don't know what happened, but she went to see Lord, somebody or other, Lord Rosemary, I think it was, uh, about shipping you know, nice kids to Canada. Uh, she wouldn't let me be evacuated with all those guys, the children you see going with labels around their necks and going off to be dumped on somebody. She wouldn't have anything like that. We went uh, to a place called Shepton Mallet, um, which was near Bristol, um, which was said to be one of those nice, safe places. And my mother and I arrived uh, with our trunks, we travel with enormous amount of luggage because we used to expect somebody else to carry it, you see. Um, and uh, so we arrived at this farmhouse from a taxi and went in and said, to her, my mother said, how wonderful it is to be here. Oh, goody, you know, and all that. And there were all these long faces, um, people who didn't really think that we were very nice people. Um, and uh, we couldn't understand why uh, they were so miserable in this lovely place. Well, we found out. Uh, as soon as it got dark, the Germans began to bomb Bristol. And on their way to bombing Bristol, uh, the British had put up uh, decoy flares very near this farmhouse. And the Germans bom dropped their bombs on us. Uh, there were thuds in the fields around, you know. Uh, so we didn't stay there any length of time. Uh, however, I do recall that my mother uh, found a, a man who had a car who had some gas, which the people tended not to, does it? And he took us on a tour of Bristol while it was burning. Um, why he did this? I have no idea, I don't know who he was, but I remember very vividly of uh, bumpeting over the hoses that were still playing on the buildings. Well, we had no business to be touring Bristol while the, you know, while the covering from the bombing. But anyway, that's a, we did, that was my only experience of, of seeing the, the actual thing close up, because when we were in London, um, we were in Ealing, which was outside the main centre of London, we could see the enormous fires. The whole sky was red, but uh, we didn't see it face to face, as it were. Um, so anyway, from there, um, we then went north. Why we went north, I don't know. We went to a place called Rill in North Wales, which is another very dreary place. Um, and that was close to Liverpool. And within a week or two, they were bombing Liverpool. And uh, so my mother had a friend who lived in Devonshire, and uh, the friend was a girlfriend of hers, um, invited us down to her. And so we went down and stayed there. Um, several things happened while I was there. Um, one of the things was I didn't go to school, and I was losing out on the continuum that you need in education. Um, that didn't matter to me. It didn't matter to my mother. Um, and while I was there, I met a, a nice old lady who I now think was a witch. Um, she was of Greek extraction, and she had a husband who had long been dead, 
but who was upstairs and could be heard moving about upstairs, which she told me I was in, in awe of this. But anyway, she gave me some Greek coins, some ancient Greek coins, and that really was one of the things that started me uh, being interested in, in antiquities, really. So um, that was uh, a, a good thing. Uh, the fact that I wasn't going to school was considered to be a bad thing uh, by René, who was the person who owned the house, the girlfriend. And her husband, for whom she was separated, um, who was also a very rich man, uh, she talked him into paying for me to go to another, what is England's is, is a public school, uh, whatever, the private school. And uh, so that's how I got to go uh, to uh, St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence was, had been evacuated from Ramsgate because in Ramsgate they were shelling over from France when they killed a lot of people. So they had gone to Northamptonshire uh, to a house uh, that belonged to the Wake family, uh, a very old English family. Um, and so we were housed there throughout the war. Uh, it's amazing to sit uh, and sleep in rooms that are filled with Van Dyck paintings, Vermeers, they had a great art collection, and the family moved out and left it all to us. And the amazing thing was that over the years, and I, uh, we became friends afterwards, uh, nothing was damaged. Um, and it was quite extraordinary because it was a beautiful house, beautifully furnished, and here were these wretched boys knocking about in it. Uh, <laughs> but I was still not a very good pupil. And the reason I wasn't not a very, well, that's one of the excuses that I wasn't a very good pupil, was because I hadn't been to school for so long. Um, and so I could do things, uh, history uh, and geography and art and things like that, but things, sciences and maths and things that needed a, a flow of knowledge, I didn't have. Um, so I did well on a few things and badly on others. Um, I was still um, wearing uh, large brown boots because of my earlier plaster incarnation. Or in, and uh, so I had difficulty being a sportsman. You know, I, was, I was a clapper at the side and that was about it. You know? Except I had to uh, uh, learn to climb a rope in a tree. Uh, this was because I was becoming, getting a certificate A in the cadet force. Um, but it was imperative that I got this because uh, we had been visited by a, an officer, I think he was a captain, um, who was recruiting and recruiting likely lads. Um, and so anyway, um, it was required that I, be, one of the things I had to do before I could be eligible was to climb this damn tree. Uh, I thought I did it, uh, because I remember sliding with my hands were getting raw and so on. Um, years later, I found out the certificate that I was supposed to have had said, fail the tree. Um, so anyway, but anyway, um, this man, this officer, uh, called on us for volunteers to go to the Indian Army. Um, and two of us signed up. Uh, what we didn't know, or we were carefully not told, was that the reason they needed these bright young officers was because uh, the Indian troops uh, were not too keen on us. Um, and if the officers got killed, they left. Um, and, and so uh, the Japs were shooting the officers out of the trees and getting through them at an alarming rate. So we were really cannon fodder being sent out there. Uh, but I, as it turned out, I never went. 
uh, because um, I had uh, some cartilages taken out of my knee and then I got a, a leg smashed up or knee partially smashed up, same knee, um, when a, a thing called a thunder flash went off in the ditch while I was um, uh, training. And uh, so the ship that I was supposed to have gone out on um, with my friend, colleague, uh, went without me. And by that time, it was uh, April of uh, 45. And they said, a uh, young man, they said, uh, you're still underage. You can stay on perhaps in the pay corps. I couldn't add. Uh, so <laughs> I, I came out. And that was the end of my ignominious military career. Um, I was sorry that I didn't be able to see it through. But my chum, who did go, uh, survived in India, uh, was shifted to Palestine, um, where he was in the Palestine police for a while, and then he went to Kenya, to the King's African Rifles, where I think he was killed um, by the Mau Mau. So it, uh, it wouldn't have been a very good transition. Um, but while I was at St. Lawrence, which the house was called Courton Hall, um, I started to write plays. Um, and uh, wrote two of them, which were put on in the school hall. And the village came and everybody was happy about it. Uh, but it gave me an idea that this is something I would like to be a playwright. Um, but uh, when I came out of the army, I still thought that would be nice. And so I went back to the school and talked to the headmaster, who was really very nice. Well, I mean, he, he shouldn't have been because I was a little lousy with you. Um, and he uh, had a friend or a, an ex-boy from the school um, who was a fairly distinguished actor, um, character actor. And he uh, got me a job at the Connaught Theatre in Worthing as assistant stage manager. Uh, this would have been uh, 45, the autumn of 45. This was a theatre that was owned by uh, the Rank, J. Arthur Rank organization, which were the principal filmmakers in England at that time. Um, and uh, they sent their starlets down to this theatre to learn how to act. Um, and it was a very good theatre. Um, this is the first thing I ever did there. It's 1945. Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> where I was the um, f frog footman and the knave of hearts. So, so, right here. Um, the frog footman had this huge plas plaster head, or whatever it was, fiberglass, I suppose, something like that, in which I was encased. Um, it was the first professional thing I'd ever done in the theatre. Um, I was terrified. Um, and being shut inside this head, which I could hardly hear out. But the, we had a lead actress whose name was Deirdre Doon. I've never heard of her since. But she came uh, to rehearsals, word perfect, not only for herself, but for the whole damn show, uh, which everybody was very irritated about. They thought this was upstaging everybody. But for me, it was a tremendous help because on the first night, inside the head, I froze. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she fed me the lines. And for all my life, I've been grateful to Deirdre Doon, who saved me <laughs> on that memorable occasion. Uh, uh, so anyway, that, that is where this sort of thing started. And then for the next f four years, um, I was in various theatre companies doing shows. Uh, I was a lousy actor. Um, and had no future in that. And I didn't want to be. I, I really wanted to be a playwright. 
and uh, I felt that it was very helpful to come up to through the through the ranks, as it were. Um, but you can't get money as a playwright until you have a play that, that somebody wants, um, which I didn't. Uh, and so I became a stage manager, and then eventually became a stage director. Um, and I had learned uh, at the Connaught Theatre uh, to paint scenery, um, which is really quite an art. Uh, you have to put all these flats together and it has to fit. Um, and we had a, a scenic painter whose name was George Flower, who had been the scenic artist at Drury Lane. Uh, and we had this huge frame behind the set in the back wall of the theatre, which the set for next week, because this is weekly, uh, was being painted while the show was going on down below. And this frame would then come up and down, you know, and all those flats. Uh, and so I learnt um, how to be a, a scene painter. And uh, so from several productions uh, after that, after I left Worthing, uh, I was a scenic artist. And this was my last one here. Uh, I did Cinderella um, in uh, Penzance. Um. <laughs> yeah, so all the scenes for, the, for this show, for some reason or other, I kept. So this. Um, anyway, there they are. The ballroom scene. <laughs> so they s still live on in the trunk. Uh, my, I, I don't think my wife has ever seen them, so my present wife has ever seen them, so they'll probably throw them away. Um, but anyway, that's part of my life in the theatre. Um, I, after I had been uh, in one of the shows at a place called John Gay Theatre in Barnstable in Devonshire, um, I decided, or an actor who I had known at the Connaught and I, both of us out of work, had this brilliant idea. We would start something called London Mobile Cinemas. So here am I back to the projector from Cheam, you see. Um, and we would travel into the West Country, which I knew because I'd been in the theatre down there, and show movies, good movies, uh, at small uh, village halls and places like that. And that we could make a good deal of money like that, we thought. Well, um, it didn't quite work out like that. Uh, we bought ourselves a projector, and we couldn't afford a second projector, so you had to stop in the middle to change the uh, It was a 16 millimeter thing. Uh, and anyway, we set out um, on the uh, New Year's Eve on uh, January 1947. Uh, we got as far as Salisbury, heading west. Uh, it was snowing. Um, by the time we got there, uh, this was an old car from before the war. You had a, a label stuck on London Mobile Cinema. Uh, we got into the town square at about two o'clock in the morning, it was snowing hard, and there we stuck. Uh, there was nobody alive in the whole of the town, it seemed. Everything was dead, and we sat there. And I remember this is one of my great moments of freezing to death uh, in this car. Uh, through the night of New Year's Day. Um, there are some things that really stand out. Anyway, w the snag with this great idea uh, was that uh, if you're going to show uh, movies in a village hall, if it's only lit by oil lamps, you have a real problem. Uh, and we found we couldn't do it. I mean, they didn't, there was no power. So uh, we had to move, we had planned to move away uh, from out of Barnstable, which I knew, 
from two or several villages nearby because we had enough gas to last to do that. But we had to go further because we couldn't find places, halls with, with power. Um, we finally moved down to a place called Biddeford, near Biddeford, and uh, we rented a house uh, that hadn't been occupied since uh, before the war. It was a, a tourist house, two-story thing, on a hill. It's called Blurridge. Uh, and so this is where we uh, had to live. It had no power either, but uh, we did have oil lamps. And uh, the first night that we were there, and the snow had been falling, and, and, and we'd had a show, but virtually nobody came to it. And we were really in despair. And I remember sitting in the hallway of this house, which had a strange uh, spiral sort of staircase went up out front. We were sitting down here with our oil lamp and uh, eating baked beans out of a can. And <laughs> the light went up. And uh, so I, being the youngest of the group, was sent to get another lamp, and we got another lamp, and shortly after that, it went out. Four of these lamps went out in series, one after the other. Um, and we subsequently uh, learned that it was supposed to be haunted. Uh, and we were there four nights before we were sort of driven out by the spooks. Uh, the second night, um, we woke up, at least I woke up, and the half of the house was shut up because we only rented half the house. Um, and the half of the house that was not being used, suddenly the doors in that house, part of the house, began to open and shut. And we came out onto the landing, looking down into the hallway, and at that point the, uh, we saw, or, or no, maybe we heard, the door into the living room down below open and then shut. Um, it was a strange place because in, all over this house there were signs saying, uh, bless this house and things like that. You know? Anyway, that room we didn't use. Anyway, so that was the second night. The next night, um, we saw a strange light in one of the bedroom windows, which came up across the top of the window from nowhere, and then it faded and disappeared. So that was the third night. The fourth, we were pretty edgy by then. Uh, and on the fourth night, I had gone to bed, uh, and my room was L-shaped, and the L part of it took up the whole bed except for about six inches. And uh, so uh, I had a candle uh, in a brass candlestick, uh, which I put down beside me on the bed and put it out. At the end of the bed, there was a small window. So, and even though uh, it was very dark, uh, there was light coming through because there was snow on the ground which reflected into it. And uh, I was sitting uh, in the bed under a theatrical curtain, which we had borrowed from the theatre, um, which had weights and cords and things attached to it. Um, I then woke up and saw what appeared to be a black knob, like a great big human-sized doorknob, which went like that, uh, down below the end of the bed. Uh, and I, I thought to myself, well, I better, I'm going to give this ten, and then I'm going to throw the candlestick at it. Uh, so I gave it ten, and probably a great many more, uh, and eventually I hurled the candlestick down. But I was all tangled up in the wire and strings and weights and things, and, you know, and, and just fell flat on my face on the bed, and it, it was gone. And whatever it was, no longer was there. Uh, was it all imagination? Were well, these things all imagination? I have no idea. But years later, first wife and I went back to see the house, and uh, we had forgotten where it was. And so we went to the butcher's shop and said, do you know where this house is? And he said, oh, yes, I know that house. <laughs> <laughs> and the people who owned it 
had had the same experiences. And they, when they had been renovating the house, uh, they found that under the living room, um, about three feet down, uh, there was the, the, the floors of another house. So they felt that whatever was in this house came from that house. So that was that. Uh, but it also brought the uh, London mobile cinemas to a grinding halt, uh, which was followed shortly afterwards by breaking the back axle. Um, so the whole thing thereupon died. Um, and uh, here is I out of work again. <laughs> you know. Well, it became apparent as people were coming back from the war, soldiers being demobbed, uh, the theatrical profession was filling up. Uh, it had been fairly easy to get jobs when everybody was still in the army in the way. Uh, they, were even, they were even glad to have sort of not very good actors like me. <laughs> Uh, but it was coming harder and harder to find, find work. And uh, listening to a radio program on the BBC, uh, I heard that there was a man who went down to the River Thames uh, when the tide was low and found antiquities, coins and buttons and things. And I thought, well, after I'd been around the agents in the morning, and the tide was low in the afternoon, as it was, uh, why not go down there and take a look at that? Uh, so I began to do that. And uh, the uh, result of that uh, was my getting in touch with the Guildhall Museum in London, uh, which was then uh, occupied or run by a man called Adrian Oswald, who became a very famous archaeologist. Um, and so I went uh, as a volunteer to help him uh, because that was the beginning of the reconstruction of the city. Now, this is a bag which says on the side, do not wash, because from that day that I found this material, I kept it together uh, and it's never been out of this bag. Um, and it is now. That's what you find on the Thames any day. Clay pipes, 17th century, 18th century, pieces of, of Delftware, 17th century pieces, um, bits of chamber pots, a handle from a chamber pot. Uh, and I learned about the, the post medieval period, is what we, we call it colonial over here, um, from learning what all this was. Um, and I learnt it by uh, washing pottery uh, in the museum uh, and Oswald standing over me and saying, you know, this is this and this is that. And eventually I became sort of known for being able to do this. But anyway, this is a, this is a typical group of stuff from one morning's hunting uh, on the, yes, no, um, even a spoon. <laughs> but anyway, that's just what you, we walked up and I walked up and down, my, my, my assistant, um, my first wife, who came to join me at Guildhall. Oh, I didn't mention the fact that I was hired, eventually, <laughs> at Guildhall to be the assistant to um, Adrian Oswald. Um, the museum had been closed during the war and all its antiquities had been shipped to safety. And they had been shipped back and still stayed in boxes because the library had taken over all the museum space and had no intention of giving it back. Uh, so Adrian had virtually no museum, but vast quantities of boxes, uh, and one very little tiny gallery, which was on the way to the toilets. <laughs> it wasn't a very good place. Um, so 
this was the beginning of the reconstruction of London after the war. And uh, one of the things that I found in the Thames was that. Uh, and this is one of the bombs that did all the damage. Uh, I've always kept this because if it hadn't been for this, the city wouldn't have burned and I would never have become the archaeologist for the city of London. <laughs> uh, but this is the cause of the, the fire. The interesting thing about this is that it was made in 1935 when Germany was still tied by the Versailles Treaty and was not allowed to make things like this. But anyway, um, Hitler was doing it. Um, I worked uh, with Oswald uh, on the first building sites to be developed after the war. And uh, he was a good teacher. Uh, we worked first at the Bankside Power Station, which is now converted into a uh, Tate Modern Gallery. Um, and there were factories over there in the 17th, 18th century making glass, making pottery, and so forth. Um, and so I learned a great deal from him uh, while we were struggling to just salvage stuff. Um, and we didn't have, there was no opportunity to do proper archaeology, but it, it, it was, uh, it was a, a learning experience about all this kind of stuff for me, because that's where a lot of it was made. Um, but Oswald um, got a pneumonia after I'd been on the staff for about two weeks. And he left the museum and never came back. And so for several weeks, I was the entire staff of the city's museum. I mean, I was, what, 22, whatever it was, um, totally untrained. Um, and having to do salvage on any site that turned up. And so we were dealing um, with uh, on where the Mithras temple was later found. There was a a uh, Mithraic temple found. Uh, and this was a site opposite that, and it was a huge hole in the ground. I mean, it went down 40 feet or so. And 20 feet of that was a built up London from Roman times onwards. And there were three uh, great fires in London, which meant the ground went red because the ground was on clay, um, with each fire, it, it burnt it red. And so the first fire was the Boudican or Bodicea's uh, uprising against the Romans in 61 AD. Uh, and the second one occurred about 100 years later in the reign of, Henry, of Hadrian. And the third one was the fire of 1666, which destroyed London. Uh, and then there was this one. Uh, so I realized that I did not have the experience. I'd learned about all this, which is post-medieval, but I didn't know much about the Roman stuff. Uh, and uh, I uh, obtained a, an assistant who was a volunteer to start with, um, Audrey Baines, who um, was foolish enough to marry me after a year. Uh, and she was already a student of, at Bristol University uh, studying Roman Britain. So she knew more about it than I did at that point. Uh, and so uh, together we worked on, uh, on these and other sites. We had nothing to, we, uh, to do. We had no tools. We had no money. We just had jobs. At least I just had jobs. She was still a volunteer. Um, we had a, one camera, uh, which Oswald dropped in the street, so its back was sprung and held together with tape. Um, and so uh, I had no photographic experience up to that, and these were um, a strange uh, 118 film, which was a rather strange film type. Um, so I had to do the photography and learned to do the drawings and all that. 
Um, and that's how we uh, handled the city for seven years. Um, now, I got into a lot of trouble um, because the librarian of the Guildhall had, uh, was fearful that uh, the museum, his museum, he was responsible for the museum, um, would never reopen um, and uh, unless the, the city gave it a lot more money. The L London Museum, which was at Kensington Palace, um, was the rival. Uh, we did the city, what was called the square mile of the city, uh, and the London Museum did outer London, the London County Council area. They were always rivals. And uh, the librarian uh, said that the London Museum people are going to try and take our museum. You have got to get the city interested in what we can do. So um, I um, was then sharing an apartment with a BBC news correspondent. Uh, his name was Rennie Cutforth. He was a war correspondent. Um, and so whenever I needed, uh, when I ever found anything, I could always get the BBC. And if I got the BBC, I could also get the press, UPR and so forth, um, and the London dailies and so on. So, I was making a name for myself, sometimes it misspelt actually, um, but <laughs> I was getting known uh, and I had to uh, get, put together for the library committee every month a whole series of things that we had found. Well, most of the things we found were broken, so they wouldn't want to see things that were broken, so we spent our time at night up in the attic of the guild hall, uh, restoring pots and things so that they'd be ready for the to be shown. Uh, and it worked. Uh, the library committee liked what we did. Uh, a new senior curator was appointed because I wasn't ready to be senior curator. Um, and everything went uh, reasonably well. I became fascinated uh, by uh, the Great Fire of 1666, because the artefacts that were laid down in the earth before the fire were sealed by the fire. Therefore, they dated prior to it. Artefacts that were on top of it were later. And I became interested in uh, wine bottles at that point. Um, because uh, they have an evolution which goes all the way from the middle of the 17th century right on through. Oswald, however, had been uh, studying tobacco pipes. And uh, he had worked out a series so that you could date uh, pits and wells and if you found a pipe like that underneath something, then it was a date of that and later. Um, uh, this little group here uh, is one of my treasures. Uh, I found it at the very edge of the fire uh, in the, near the law courts um, and there was a ditch being dug by um, contractors and uh, in this ditch was the debris of the great fire uh, and I salvaged these pieces. And the thing that I find so fascinating is that this is the window pane. Somebody was looking through that window pane when the red glow of the fire consumed the house. Uh, these were their clay pipes that they had. There's a hinge from, from a cupboard, decorative hinge. Uh, and this Delftware bowl, cup, which in fact uh, is one of these. It, it goes right there. Uh, I then have all, being a romantic, which I still am, not supposed to be, but I still am, uh, I just imagine who these people were whose house was burning. 
who had drunk from this thing? Who looked through that window? Who opened that cupboard door? Uh, and to me, that's what archaeology is all about. It's about people stuff. And my career since, with the theatrical background, I suppose, has been to try and interest people in the pieces of the past. And you do that best by tying the pieces into history. So the two weave together. It becomes a three-dimensional story. Um, so that's really all th this came from. Uh, the wine bottle series, um, which I had started to work on in about 1954, uh, was still uh, at an early stage when a man called J.C. Pinky Harrington of the Park Service had just been working at Jamestown. And he came to London to find somebody who knew anything about 17th century glass. Um, I wasn't in the museum at the time, but uh, my then my wife was, and she saw Harrington and explained to him what I was doing with these bottles. Well, um, after he'd been on his tour, he hadn't found anybody else who knew anything about glass, so he came back to see me, and he did. And I don't even remember this, but it was in his journal, so <laughs> it has to be so. Um, anyway, that led to my coming to Virginia. Uh, and it did it because Colonial Williamsburg uh, thought it would be neat. Uh, Mr. John D. Rockefeller was still alive then, there was still money. <laughs> and, uh, uh, to bring a consultant over, a great expert, over from England. And so uh, the architects at um, Ed Kendrew, who was the senior architect, went to the Park Service, to Harrington, and said, do you know anybody over there who could be this consultant? And he said, well, as half the artifacts that you dig up in Williamsburg are old bottle bits, why don't you ask Noel Hugh uh, to come over from the Guildhall Museum? Uh, I knew nothing about Williamsburg at all. And I knew nothing about Jamestown either, for that matter. <laughs> Um, but I did know about bottles, and so I accepted, came over here. I remember on the plane coming over um, that I sat next to a lady anthropologist, um, by accident, I mean, it's um, who was on her way to some extraordinary place called Co uh, Poughkeepsie. And I thought, this is an extraordinary place to have, place, way to have a name for anywhere, you know. I knew nothing about Indian names or all the rest of it. But this was my first inkling of what this hell is this place about? Why, why, why would anybody go to Poughkeepsie? But she had heard of Williamsburg and heard it was very nice and so on. Uh, so my first encounter with Williamsburg was actually the 4th of July of 1957. No, no, 56 when I came over briefly. Uh, and I was astonished. Um, here were all these people dressing up in funny clothes. Uh, here were all these very nice houses, all very clean, and sort of not really looked and lived in, but, you know, nice. <laughs> but what the hell were they doing? Uh, and while I was standing there on the side of the street, it was the 4th of July, a uh, uh, boiling hot day, and I was wearing an English serge suit. Uh, this was not the atti correct attire, for, but and there were all these people going around shorts and so on. Huh? Um, but then down came the, the fife and drum corps down the thing, you know, um, followed by hordes of people. And I thought, well, what is this nation all about? You know, because I hadn't seen anything on it. Well, I knew virtually nothing about its history, except it came and joined us in the war. Um, <laughs> and a lot of English people weren't too keen on that either. No. Um, and uh, so I, I knew nothing. And as uh, soon as I began to understand what it was about, I thought this was Shangri-La.
I thought it was absolutely wonderful. But the first reaction was, oh boy, what the hell have I got into? You know? um, there was a lady, I remember on this very same day, who came out of the uh, ham shop uh, and with her daughter. And she was dressed up uh, in a Norman Rockwell clothes with a hat and, and large skirt and gloves and all that. Uh, and the little girl was with her in a white dress. And uh, the woman came out in, in an accent, which I have certainly learnt, learnt was New Jersey, um, <laughs> said, do you have your quill, Miranda? And that line has stayed with me all these years because it summed up the whole idea of Williamsburg at that time. Uh, you buy the quill, this is history, and we're dressed for it. Um, it's changed a bit since then. But that was the impression one got of restrained beauty. Uh, the gardens were beautiful. Um, and the hostesses were, not, if not beautiful, were uh, wearing ball gowns and so on. Totally wrong for, for the daytime, but this is the way it was. And it was what I called a uh, chocolate box history. You know, the, you know those sampler boxes that have the coach on it and the lady and the top of the hand? And all? Well, uh, th that's how I saw it. And that's how it was in those days until the 19, late 1960s uh, when everything began to change. The archaeology being done at Colonial Williamsburg was atrocious. I mean, it basically wasn't what we call archaeology. It had gangs who dug trenches to find brick foundations and then they put buildings on the brick foundations. Uh, and the artifacts were, as a rule, thrown back into the trenches um, because the architects really only wanted to keep the stuff that related to architecture. So hinges and tiles and things like that they kept, but much of the rest of it was thrown back. What wasn't thrown back, however, went into large boxes, crates, uh, fish boxes, which were stored in the garage. And I was faced with all this stuff. But it, although it was from identified sites, I had no way of knowing where it was found, where these pieces were found in relationship to others. They were no more uh, informative collectively than these are informative collectively. They're not. They're just off the beach. And these were just off the lots. And so uh, I tried to explain to Colonel Williamsburg that there was a whole lot more to archaeology than they were doing. And. Uh, at that point, they were building the information centre. This was uh, 1956. Uh, and uh, they wanted exhibits, archaeological exhibits. And so uh, they invited me to come back and take over the Department of Archaeology to build these exhibits. Uh, they didn't think any further than that, uh, and I guess I didn't either. Um, but the, uh, my boss was uh, an amateur thespian who wanted to start a little theatre in Williamsburg. Um, he, he was, uh, I, I think I better not mention his name, but he was a very bad actor. Um, and in fact, in the great film uh, that the, you still see at, at Williamsburg, The Story of a Patriot, uh, he is the only person who had to have his lines dubbed uh, because they weren't good enough. But um, he got me to join with him in helping to create this little theatre. Uh, he lived at, uh, on Duke of Gloucester Street in Marrow's Ordinary, and it was known uh, as um, the uh, Oswald, uh, uh, <laughs> I better not mention the name, um, Little Theatre in the Basement, um, where large quantities of uh, bourbon were consumed. I never recall 
any of these readings getting beyond the second act. Um, but the little theatre did prosper, or, or seemed to be, and uh, I went back to England thinking that was the end of it. But I was then asked to come back to do this exhibit uh, and take over. Uh, but the real reason for my coming back was to direct the little theatre. Uh, had it not been for this nice man's uh, interest in amateur theatrics and the fact that I had had that background, uh, everything f fitted together. And this is really what brought me over here. Um, I had to thin out some of the people who had come from architecture to do the archaeology before, because they just hadn't the first idea what it was all about, uh, which was sad. I hated to do that. But we had to, to march on, and so we did. And uh, from there on, uh, I was doing one site after another and uh, publishing books. History became more important than beauty. Reality uh, became the thing. Uh, and I was one of the people who pushed for that. And looking back, I wish I hadn't. It wasn't that I was wrong, but I just, my own feeling was that Colonial Williamsburg was a place to come and, well, uh, uh, as one person who was the, uh, forgotten his name, um, used to send his people down here to recharge their patriotic batteries. And that's what it was. Um, and uh, uh, I was one of the people who said the gardens are too pretty, which was true. Um, and the curators got on board, and instead of having everything all neat and tidy, they would have a, a sock hanging out of a drawer. The only snag was that they had socks hanging out of numerous drawers, which was <laughs> a little bit stylized. But Anyway, that's what happened over the years. And we went from that uh, to, with the changing presidents at Colonial Williamsburg, uh, to becoming more educational. They wanted to be a university. Um, and I really wasn't um, on that line. You know, I was an archaeologist. I took the ground apart in layers, I could read the ground, um, and all that we were driven by the architects who wanted to do this building and that building, usually before I'd finished on this one. Um, but uh, the change that was coming was this university thing. So we were supposed to have field schools. Well, I never believed in field schools um, because uh, you hire a lot of people, or at least you, we hired. When I had my only field school, was at the public hospital, and uh, that uh, the idea was that we would have people school. Uh, there were social studies school teachers who were going to come here for a month and learn archaeology and go back to their school systems and take the logic of archaeology with them. Um, you know, this is on top of that, and that's earlier than this. Sim archaeology is essentially very simple. You can gussy it up with science, but if you can't read the ground and take the artifacts and know what they are and what they date uh, and see them in context, uh, you, you don't have what I call archaeology. Um, so field schools uh, produce, get a lot of areas open and then they leave, and you're stuck with all those half-finished excavations. Uh, and the problem with that is that uh, the weather gets at the excavations and that's when you don't have enough people left and so on. Um, now, when we did it at the public hospital, um, I thought I was going to teach them a great deal. I didn't teach them very much, as it turned out, because the public hospital was full of brick rubble. 
and they spent the entire month extracting brick, brick rubble from the debris of 1885, which really wasn't quite what they, they were supposed to be doing. But uh, out of that, uh, one person uh, became, uh, went back to school and became a uh, leading uh, amateur archaeologist and teacher, which is what we intended, but only one out of 28. Uh, I'd hope that I could encourage uh, black participation. And so we insisted on taking one black teacher, uh, and she did nothing with it. Um, I don't know why. But it, it didn't work. But anyway, I've, I've never been very keen on, 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 on raw people. I'd rather have a small crew who do what I tell them um, than have to teach uh, people who aren't going to stay. We put, you know, you put a lot of time in, into teaching them and, it, uh, and expect it to pay off. They go back to school and that's the end of it. Till next summer, they go somewhere else. Um, when we started at Martin's Hundred, which was the Carter's Grove plantation, um, I uh, did have a couple of students who came um, and I taught them how to excavate a post hole. Now a post hole has a hole and a post inside it and packed around the post there's dirt. Uh, when you pull the post out, then fill goes into it and so you have three sections. You've got the hole, you've got the backfill, and you've got the post. And I explained how you excavate that. And this guy said, well, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, now what? And I said, well, you spend the whole summer doing that. He said, not me. <laughs> um, no, uh, I always thought that hired people uh, who, whose main interest in the end was getting money on the way they'd learn about archaeology and that would be a double dipper for them. That's what I thought. Every moment uh, in an archaeological dig uh, has its excitement. What will you find next? What does it mean? How will it fit into the story that you're trying to recreate? Um, so there's, there's, it's a sense of discovery. And discovery is invariably exciting. People ask me, what was the most, recent, the most exciting thing you ever found? And I usually reply, rather glibly, the last thing. Because one uh, leads to another. Uh, I remember at Martin's Hundred, uh, I was uh, filming, making a film, which incidentally won all sorts of prizes, um, on, the, on the dig. And uh, we had our own crew in those days. And uh, so it wasn't like a professional uh, company coming in and you have to do it in such much a time. When we moved along from this here to there to there, I could call on the crew and we'd film it. Uh, it called for a good deal of guesswork on my part. What are we going to find today and how are we going to shoot it? Um, and on one occasion in the woods to the east of Carter's Grove, uh, Carter's Grove um, we were working on a 17th century rubbish pit. And I had explained in a previous scene how you date the ground by tobacco pipes. And uh, there is a numerical system uh, which Harrington thought out of uh, you measure the bore down the pipe uh, and collectively uh, you arrive at a date bracket. So anyway, I had explained this at good length uh, on the previous day um, and had come to the conclusion that this particular pit dated uh, from uh, about 1619. Um, that's what the pipes said. Well, uh, as the digging went on, uh, I was talking about this again in a connection to this particular pit and how it was so helpful to have all these pipes. Uh, and then, uh, as I was scraping and brushing, 
uh, a shaft of light came down through the uh, woods and lighted on a piece of pottery in the pit which said 1632, <laughs> which made total nonsense <laughs> what I'd been claiming the day before. Um, <laughs> That was on the film. That's in the film, um, because that's where we we, you know, we we shot it as we saw it, and we and the mistakes are still part of the show. Um, but there are those eureka moments sometimes, which are <laughs> slightly embarrassing. The first settlement um, was uh, by uh, Ralph Lane. Uh, on road, on the north end of Roanoke Island, um, and uh, he came when he came over. He brought with him uh, scientists, um, and uh, one of them was a Vietnamese, a Vietnamese, <laughs> Viennese, a Vietnamese a little early. Um, <laughs> It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> um, anyway, um, they set up a uh, settlement and built a fort. And the Park Service had excavated this area. Harrington had been the excavator. And they had reconstructed a fort. Um, well, the, the idea was that we were supposed to prove that the fort really was the first fort. We proved that it wasn't, um, and this has always been a course of source of embarrassment for the Park Service, um, who actually tries to sort of play it down. Um, the remains of the uh, science centre, which was a wooden uh, frame structure, uh, posts. We didn't see really what the building looked like, but we had uh, fragments. Uh, of crucibles, um, copper, and so forth, um, and uh, distilling things. Um, but the rem those remains were cut through by the ditch for the fort. And when we excavated inside the fort, they were continued. So the fort had been cut through the uh, science center and had to be later. The question was how much later? Um, my own view was that it was late 17th century, early 18th century. Um, but uh, the only, the science center so far is the only evidence that's been found of uh, Ralph Lane's occupation of that, of that area. So we, we never, nobody's found the fort. Probably been uh, eroded away uh, because of a buff there which is still going. But um, nobody has put up any kind of sign on that site to say what it was. The fort is still there, the fort is still interpreted, but nobody has said this is where the decision was made to colonize Virginia, because that's what happened. Um, the uh, evidence that was taken back of the possibilities for uh, metallic source resources and things of that sort. They were still looking for gold, but they didn't find it. Um, but it was that decision um, that was made back in England after Lane's people left, uh, that said, okay, this is worth doing. So it really did start on the, in that little open space uh, between the trees down the, <laughs> beside the fort. Um, and so when I go back down there, I, I, I bow twice to it. <laughs> I've been all sorts of things over time. I've been around a long time, too long. Um, that uh, I was asked by the Park Service to find Jamestown oh, a good many years ago. And so what I did was I took all the tobacco pipes that had been found all over Jamestown, 
have been found by uh, Harrington and his man Carter. Um, and I came to the conclusion that the earliest pipes came from the areas immediately upstream from the church. Um, and uh, Harrington dug a trench beside um, the church from what was, was the APVA's po post office. It was the, 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 and this trench uh, contained fragments of crucibles. Um, then I studied the artifacts that had been found uh, during the uh, reconstruction, before the reconstruction of the church uh, in 1907. Um, and in the grave of Governor Yardley, who died, I think, in 28, um, were um, several artifacts that were military. Um, a uh, cover for a uh, uh, powder flask. And so I knew, I thought I knew, that before the church was built, before the first church was built, there was a military occupation in that area above them. And so it became my belief that that's where the fort really was. Um, the park service said it's out in the river. And, and they could even tell you the coordinates for it. Um, but my feeling was that it was where it is. Um, and I, uh, I remember going with Bill, and he said to me, where should we start? And there was a hollow just beside us, in front of the fence of the church. And I said, well, Harrington's trench came through here. There's a hollow there for some reason. Why not start there? And so he did. Now, at that time, I was chairman of the committee, uh, the APVA's committee. Um, that was Bill's idea. But really, what they wanted was my name. They didn't really want any interference. Um, and so I had a tendency to overplay my role. Um, when I found people digging with picks when they should have been doing it with trowels, I, I would complain. Um, and I got into trouble over the uh, field school thing, because Bill had, was a believer in field schools, and he had done very well with them uh, at um, uh, Monticello. Uh, but the end product of that was that the school came, the areas were all open, and then this, the almost the entire staff disappeared. And he, uh, I think there were three of them left. There was Bill uh, and Nick Lucchetti and one other person, I think. Um, and I said that you need to have more people. He said, we don't have the money. Uh, I said, well, you've got all these excavations open uh, and they shouldn't be left over the winter, uh, which he recognized. And so I, he said, I said to him, well, should I go to the APVA and try and get you some more money? Uh, which I did. Um, that was not appreciated by the APVA. Uh, and Bill didn't remember that he urged me to talk to them. Um, and so uh, after a year, and, and I also complained, I remember, uh, of artifacts being left in the ground, uh, metal objects, which should have been taken out and conserved immediately, uh, were being left there because the uh, uh, press would be coming. Well, and from the APVA's point of view, certainly not from Bill's, but the APVA's point of view, the press was what mattered. The press was more important than the artifacts. And that stuck in my craw rather more than somewhat. Uh, so uh, after uh, a year, they told me my uh, sojourn was over, <laughs> which 
I was really very relieved about because it was getting, uh, I had other things to do um, and I didn't, Bill was a good friend and I didn't want to screw things up. So, so, that, so my uh, uh, connection with it was saying, dig here, get money, don't get the money, <laughs> and good night. <laughs> but I, I don't bear any grudges on that because it, I, I, Bill had a difficult job, particularly at the beginning. Well, the, 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 yeah, the first book I did was I did, I, I did in about 1955, 54, 55. It was called rather grandly, Archaeology in Britain. Um, <laughs> this was precocious. As, as I had said earlier and didn't finish saying, was that um, all the publicity that I got at the Guildhall on behalf of the Guildhall Museum was hated uh, by the London Museum who had never heard of me and didn't want to. Uh, and uh, the great thing is to uh, become a, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. Um, and that's the key. Um, and uh, for about 10 years uh, I was blackballed by the profession because I, I didn't have the background that I should have had. Um, eventually, uh, a professor called Martin Biddle, uh, who found the great palace of Nonsuch in England, um, he uh, got me into the antiquities. And uh, I'm very flattered that he did a book on uh, Nonsuch Palace and dedicated it to me um, because he felt I had done quite a bit. But anyway, this is the first book. But what it did, um, it goes from prehistory uh, all the way through to wine bottles. Nobody had done that before. No, the archaeology wasn't that, if it wasn't Roman or medieval, it wasn't archaeology. And that's what's changed over time. I was the first vice president of the Society for Post Medieval Archaeology in England. <laughs> um, but it, was, it came out of that. Um, this book I did for uh, Foils, a, a bookshop in London. Um, connections is always helpful. Uh, my father uh, rented a house from the owner of Foils. <laughs> so that's how I got to that. Uh, a few years later, I was in, back in London and somebody said, you've got a new book. Uh, and I said, I haven't. But it turned out I had. Um, this is a pirated version of that. Um, completely ruined because they put in photographs and things that had nothing to do with it. Um, and I went to the store, this is in Foils, where, um, which had a subsidiary called John Gifford. Um, and uh, I went up to the guy and I, and I said, look, look uh, this is, you shouldn't have this book in your store. And they said, oh, well, you see, we thought you was an old person what had passed on. Um, so I pointed out that I wasn't uh, and uh, went away and uh, they swore they would burn the book. A month later, I came back to the same store. There was the book. So I went out uh, to see them again. They, they worked out of Attic. They're sort of Dickensian people, a uh, small publisher. And I said... Uh, here I am with this book. <laughs> oh, yes, they said. And I said, well, you said you would draw it. And they said, well, yeah, but you said, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so this book still turns up on eBay, <laughs> on Amazon and so on. It's now considered quite rare. It's also useless. But anyway, <laughs> that was the beginning of my publishing career. The next thing, of course, was the Thames. Uh, Treasure in the Thames. Um, and uh, that really went quite well. Uh, and it now fetches a large sum of money, actually. Um, 
and I was down on the Thames one day uh, and found a man digging a hole. Um, he's one of these metal detector people, uh, which I, in my day, you didn't do that. That was not kosher. Uh, what you, you, you use a little trowel, you tickle the surface, and you picked up all this stuff. But you didn't dig holes. Now, these people, however, dig holes, large holes. Um, but they knew their stuff. And this one, one guy gave me some uh, nails and a hook and things. And, and, and I said, well, what are the dates of these? Oh, he said, the first half of the 17th century. And I said, well, how do you know that? And they said, well, you see this layer here? They're under that layer, and there was a coin over this layer of the late 17th century. This guy knew what he was talking about. Uh, the next day, I was at the Tower of London and looking at stuff that they had found from excavations there. And they seemed to have no idea that there was any relationship between one artifact and another. And here was this guy. But the interesting thing about this guy was, um, he said he'd heard of me, and I've forgotten how I, that came up, uh, and he said, yeah, this is the great book, he said, and when we find one in a library, we goes and nicks it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wasn't that the, one of the great honors, uh, you know, <laughs> accolade? <laughs> oh. But uh, then there came, you know, when I came over here, um, I had done a, a children's book on archaeology, which is um, great moments in archaeology. Um, and I wrote that one while I was over here doing my first trip over. But um, because I'd already then published uh, three books, uh, I was asked to write one for Colonial Williamsburg which we call Williamsburg's Buried Treasure. Um, the snag with that was that everybody got into the act. Um, and the architects would want this, and the landscape architects would want that. And then we've had 15 people on this particular project. We need to have all their names in it. Uh, and the book was a mess. And uh, when Karl Hammerstein, who was then the president, saw it, he said, this isn't what I had in mind. And I said, it wasn't what I had in mind either. But uh, the uh, board um, of the early American history and culture, which still exists, um, had uh, Alfred Knopf on it. And Knopf asked me whether I had anything that I was doing. And I said, I'd written this lousy book. Uh, so he said, well, could you broaden it, rewrite it? And so I did. And it became uh, uh, Here Lies Virginia, and it's still in print after all these years. I think it was published in 63 originally. So that one's been around. And then we did Martin's Hundred. Uh, and a lot of people have liked this because they think it reads like a detective story. And it was. That's exactly what it was. One clue leading to another. Uh, and in fact, when we found the uh, massacre victim uh, outside the fort, uh, who had his head bashed in from behind, um, we found that there was a, um, a trial going on in England uh, of a man who had uh, killed his wife uh, with, a, uh, with a shovel and then thrown her off a bridge. Uh, but the uh, police, the pathologist, looked at our skull, compared that skull and said, yes, these could be both struck by a spade. Um, so there was a little, you know, we look anywhere we can. Um, and the, we had an awful lot of help from the, the pathologist at Richmond, the uh, doctor, Telefero, I think was her name, yes. Anyway, uh, this book was, uh, was, went well, it was published also in England. Um, then came, well, there'll be other ones in between, but th this one did quite well, all the best rubbish. And that came from 
a child uh, in uh, St. Kitts in the Caribbean um, who was heard uh, uh, saying as she went down the street looking for trash and crying, all the best rubbish is gone. And I thought, well, that's <laughs> we keep all the best rubbish and that's how this came about. Um, I, along the way, I wrote, started writing novels and the biggest of them, of course, is, is this thing. Ah! <laughs> That's uh, a book that, based on um, the collection that Audrey and I put together over the years of ceramics. Um, and when she died, I didn't know um, what we were going to do with the collection. I, I didn't think I was going to live much longer. Um, fortunately, that was 16 years ago, more than 16 years ago. And my present wife has made sure that uh, I'm still here, which I thank her greatly. Um, but anyway, um, I was going to give the collection to Winterthur Museum. Winter, if Winterthur would publish a book about it or a catalogue, uh, they said they would, uh, and then they didn't do it. Uh, and we'd already given them part of the collection. Um, and so, uh, the uh, the book uh, went to uh, John Prown. The, the, the idea of the book went to John Prown uh, of the Chipstone Foundation. And so uh, they said, all right, give the collection to us. Uh, and we did. And a lot of what we still, well, some of what we still see here um, is part of that collection. Uh, Carol and I have been collecting since, and so <laughs> vastly most of this is, is, is subsequent, not part of that collection. But they publish this book, and it's been quite well received. It's very good for a doorstop. Um, and then uh, it was suggested that I ought to write an autobiography, and you probably figured out why I shouldn't. Um, and that is that. Um, and people have been kind to it. Um, and the last book uh, is the book I did on Belzoni, which uh, is this one. Um, and actually it's my favorite book of all of them. Um, and it uh, results from my travels with my first wife in Egypt, three different occasions, uh, in pursuit of this man's activities. Uh, this man, Belzoni, was a, uh, a uh, circus strongman. Actually, he didn't start that way. He was, uh, he was going to be a hydraulic engineer, and he, he couldn't find anybody who wanted a hydraulic engineer. And he finally went to England thinking he would find it there, and he didn't. But he did find a stage manager uh, who got him a job at the Sadler's Wells Theatre. Uh, and his job was to be, uh, he was six foot six tall, and he was very strong, so he could lift people up uh, with chairs and things like that. Uh, and so he, he became the Patagonian Samson. Um, and for ten years he, he toured, uh, he, he met his wife, um, who was slightly younger than he was, uh, and she, we think, was a rope dancer. Uh, and they, they toured together. Um, they were a remarkable couple. He finally winds up in, in Egypt, uh, as in being in, he went there to be a hydraulic engineer for the uh, Muhammad Ali the Pasha. Uh, he built a great wheel to uh, haul up water from the Nile, and at the great demonstration it broke uh, and fell apart, and he was fired. Um, and so he got to know the English consul, consul there who was looking for antiquities and he became the employee of that. And he became the famous, most famous archaeologist of his, of his era. But it was at a time when there weren't any archaeologists. Um, people collected stuff. But they didn't have associations, but we do. Um, and uh, so my interest in him came about in part because he'd started in the theater. I was never a strong man, but uh, <laughs> we, we trod the same ground. 
and I came into archaeology uh, through the back door, as he did. Now I got to, to be a, I elected to the Society of Antiquaries. He always wanted to be, and they wouldn't let him, largely because he didn't have the background, and also because he was a foreigner. Um, there was a great deal of uh, bias in those days. But anyway, uh, after uh, w we had been back in uh, Egypt uh, three times, uh, the last time was for doing a, a, a lecture for the National Geographic Society, not about the antiquities, but about the graffiti on the antiquities, uh, because I find that those are fascinating. And I have tracked these people down, and some of them went back to America and Boston and so on, and became very famous people. Uh, so that became a, a, a cause for me. And while we were in our period of going back and forth to Egypt, uh, I bought a copy of Belzoni's narrative, his book, which came with a set of artwork, of his drawings, which were published uh, in uh, 1820. And they are some of the most beautiful uh, renderings I've ever seen, and he did these uh, in the darkness of the tombs. So he was the candlelight, you know. Um, and they're just, just super. Uh, perhaps we could take a look at one or two of them. Um, but anyway, uh, having bought this book and, these, and owning these things, and knowing that when they fall into the hands of dealers, the dealers tear them out of the books and sell them at very large prices, individually. Here was a complete set. And so uh, I wanted to stay that way. But I'd thought that it would make a book. Um, and so it has, uh, and the color is pretty well done. The University of Virginia Press said, uh, we can't do it in color, we don't have the money. Uh, if you can find the money to do it in colour, uh, we'd like to do it. And, and so a friend of ours who has a plantation, who had a plantation across the four-mile tree on the other side of the river, uh, Bill Harrison, um, he put up the money for the colour and he died two weeks after the book came out, which was really tragic. In 1993, Queen Elizabeth II uh, inducted you into the order of uh, uh, the officer of the British Empire. Well, it's true, yes. Um, I don't know, have never known who put me up for it. Um, and uh, it was a great moment, uh, a slightly wry moment, you know. <laughs> um, but it was an honor. I have always felt, being a British citizen, that I was really working on British history. Um, and I was contributing to British history. But at the same time, I was contributing, I thought, to American history. Um, but in those days, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, I was still very British, um, and this was left over from my upbringing. You know, it was a different country then. But the more I went back, and I found that the English people had vanished, um, and the, the Pakistanis and the West Indians and the Poles, and it became a cosmopolitan country. They had rebuilt London, the London I knew, which is what was left of Victorian London, had all been destroyed. Uh, and I, I belonged, my father belonged to a prestigious club, and, and he got me into the club, and I stayed a member uh, long after he died, uh, because the staff were all old people who'd been there since the First World War. Uh, and then they were gone. And I found, and my own, my friends were dying. 
uh, and I found I didn't belong there anymore. And so in the end, I'm not sure where I am, but having been honored by the Queen, I feel I can't do anything else. I am deeply honored by that. But I also worry about what had happened to the country. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I worry what's happening to this country uh, because they are very, very similar. Most of it's luck, you know. Uh, really is. All my life has been luck. There was a time when I was uh, unemployed and I was doing the thing on the Thames and uh, I was coins that I found in the river I exchanged on the bus and I knew they were duds. That's the, they used to be thrown out of the Billingsgate fish market when they found that they were duds and an awful lot of coins were duds. Um, and uh, so I, I knew that I, if I changed them on the bus, if I could take a two shilling piece and change it on the bus, I can get one shilling and sixpence back and the one shilling and sixpence would buy my supper. I mean, it was that bad at that time. So I've been very lucky.